Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston Literary Festival based in South Carolina, USA. I would like to welcome you from wherever in the world that you may be watching. If the past fraught 18 months has taught us anything, it has taught us that books and their authors, whether classical or contemporary, really matter. In trying times, readers turn to books for insights into the human condition, for the opportunity to be transported to other worlds, for ideas, for arguments, for inspiration, for experiencing the impossible, for laughter and for the release of tears. The festival will provide the opportunity to engage with a galaxy of literary and artistic stars, as well as up and coming writers who are making waves. We have a far flung cast list featuring authors from all over the United States, as well as the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Whether they're talking about former literary trailblazers or gene editing or human rights or popular culture or feminism or medieval nuns or innumerable other subjects, they have one thing in common, the ability of compelling stories to linger in our imaginations. We're grateful to all our speakers, whether virtual or in-person for sharing their talents. Please thank them by purchasing their books. The festival couldn't happen without a committed team and board. We would like to thank our donors, both private and public, who generously make the festival possible. The College of Charleston, our academic partner, has been an invaluable source of support. It's no accident that the festival takes place in Charleston, a prime destination with a progressive literary and artistic tradition. Please come and see for yourselves, but make sure to visit during the Charleston Literary Festival, which takes place during the first half of November each year. Meanwhile, I hope that you enjoy the 2021 Charleston Literary Festival and that it makes you think and dream afresh. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Ewan Lee and Kirk Connott. I'm delighted to welcome Ewan Lee and Kirk Connott to this event for the Charleston Literary Festival, which will focus on their experiences of organizing popular mass readings. During lockdown, Ewan Lee orchestrated readers from around the world in an 85-day readathon of Tolstoy's War and Peace. Kirk Knut organized a mass reading of Scott Fitzgerald's This Side of Paradise on the anniversary of its publication in 2019. Ewan Lee is the author of seven books, including novels, short story collections, and essays. She's the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship, Guggenheim Fellowship, and Wyndon Campbell Prize, amongst other honors. A contributing editor to a public space, she teaches at Princeton University. Kirk Knott is a professor and chair of English at Troy University. He's the author of The Cambridge Introduction to F. Scott Fitzgerald, among other books, and the editor of the Oxford Historical, Historical Guide to F. Scott Fitzgerald. So the format of today is that this session will last for about an hour, um, during, and which will include an opportunity to ask questions for the last 15 minutes or so. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to submit them via our chat line. It's my pleasure now to hand you over to Kirk Knott and Ewan Lee. Well, thank you very much, Diana, and welcome everyone to the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. I'm so delighted to uh, be uh, the questioner, the interrogator on this uh, particular uh, panel. Uh, I believe strongly in the need for readers to do public outreach, and this is a wonderful example of uh, encouraging folks to uh, to take on uh, reading projects. So, uh, Yoon Lee is our guest today, and uh, Professor Lee, uh, this is the book itself, and I have two questions for you to kind of start and build us a little context here. For those who may not know, could you please tell us what a public space is? And uh, I noticed one of the things that first jumped out at me when I received your book is that it does not say by, but it says with. So yes. could you maybe tell us a little bit about how 
you came to facilitate or moderate this yeah. discussion. Yes. So thank you so much, uh, Diana. And thank you, Charleston Literature Festival. And thank you, Kurt, for being here with me today. Yeah, so, so the book and the reading project is published and, and organized by A Public Space, which is a literary organization based in New York. It publishes um, magazines and, uh, and also there's a book imprint. So this book, Tolstoy Together, 80 85 Days of War and Peace with E.U. and Lee was published earlier this fall by a public space book. I think that's such a good question, Kirk, you asked about with E.U. and Lee. And because I cannot claim to be the author of this book, I can only claim to be really sort of the curator slash moderator of this discussion. So for those of you who don't know the Tolstoy Together history, just a brief history. So in 2000, I mean, sorry, 2020, so March 15th, so the world was going into lockdown. It seems like everything was shutting down. I, I myself read War and Peace every year just to entertain myself. And, and at a time I felt there was a lot of agitations and, and about uncertainties with the time we were going into. So I thought it would be good to invite people to read War and Peace with me just for 10 to 15 pages a day, which would take you know 30 minutes, maximum 40 minutes a day. Just as a way to anchor ourselves during the time during the time of uncertainty. So I approached a public space and they sent an invitation out to the world and say, we're going to start reading War and Peace together. I thought my my plan was to have five readers to read with me. And I was very heartened and surprised, joyfully surprised that about 3,000 people around the globe participated. And so the, the so the format of the of the read read together was I call it read along. So I would assign ten to fifteen pages every day on Twitter and um, a public space website. I would share three observations, my reading of the day, and then it was just open for people to have a conversation on Twitter on social media, and sometimes people do not use social media, so they would email their thoughts to us. So we, in 85 days, we finished reading War and Peace. Many of the readers were first time readers, but there were also a lot of re-readers mm -hmm. and translators. It was very heartening to see the languages re read. There were people reading in Japan, reading Japanese translation, Chinese translation, and the Portuguese translation. Swedish, Italian. So it was quite a global project. And that after that, we thought, you know, it was such a good record of a group of people spending some time together during a specific moment in history, which, you know, going back to Tolstoy, it's always about history, you know, what people do in that moment of history. So, so we thought it was a good recording for of the time and we compiled this book. That's why I said, you know, the book, if you haven't seen the book, it has two sides. On one side would be my observation. The other side would be just, you know, readers observations, readers participations. So it is not a book written by me. It's a written by, you know, 150 readers together. That's wonderful. I'm delighted that you use the word curate because that was the kind of the word that I was struggling to come up with when I was stumbling over facilitate and moderate. Mm -hmm. I think the obvious question is why War and Peace? Uh, as one of your readers says, it is a book that is 1,200 pages, 361 chapters, hundreds of characters, and usually characters with first and middle and last <laughs> names. Uh, 17 parts, four volumes, 85 days, and one masterpiece. Uh, but the question, I guess, uh, War and Peace has a reputation as maybe being one of, if not the most formidable novels that one can try to read. And I'm, I think everybody needs to hear again that you just said that you read this once a year, um, which is amazing. Uh, but tell us, what was it about War and Peace specifically that you felt like fit that, those first weeks of the pandemic? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, you're right. I think War and Peace has this reputation, and sometimes I think it's an unf unfair reputation for the book. You know, if we re do read the book, it's a page turner with all these romance, high society drama, you know, wartime drama. But I think, I th why War and Peace? I, I was very certain when I, you know, I also do read Moby Dick once a year, mm -hmm. but I didn't think about reading Moby Dick for, for the pandemic project. I think my sense was we were going into a difficult time and it has to be a big novel, but it has to be a big novel about everything. And War and Peace has everything, you know, 500, 550 characters, some of them historical, some of them, you know, made up by Tolstoy. I think there are enough enough human stories, you know, also animal stories, and there's enough, you know, essayistic meditation on history from Tolstoy. But there's also also just like soap soap opera ish drama in society. I think it's a book that everyone, you know, as long as you open and you start to read and you start to know the characters' names, that's the challenge, right? Just to match their different version of their same name. I think every reader, you know, as long as he or she opens the book, they will learn something or they will benefit from knowing this history. So I that's why I think War and Peace, I, I think we need an encyclopedic kind of novel for for the time. Great. Thank you. Um, the original reading ran from uh, it was March 18th through June 10th, 85 days, as we said, and 15 pages a day. How did you come up with that format? Did anybody say, let's do 50 pages a day first, or let's do a chapter at a time? I was, I was really struck by the, the, the bite-sized bit of 15 yeah. pages. Yes. You know, that is how I read all the books. I, 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 I you know, I read War and Peace. I take six months. Usually in the general setting is I spent six months on War and Peace and six months on Moby Dick during the year. So that actually just, it's the slow reading. I, I cannot claim that I, in, I invented that, but I did find that a very helpful way to read. It's, there's no reason to rush. You can, you know, it's just, it's a long journey. You can just make a few steps a day. So not only War and Peace, other novels, I don't sit there and, you know, devolve a novel, uh, you know, at one setting. I read slowly. And so I knew very much at the beginning, we needed to read slowly. And also just to pay attention to things rather than to the whole picture. You know, I think if you teach War and Peace in an academic setting, you know, the students read the whole novel, then we have to talk about big picture things. But in this reading, I think it's less scholastic. It's more, I call it the miscellaneous reading. It's, an, it's a reading miscellaneously and reading devotionally. So we devote our time to read War and Peace, but we look at different things. And I think for that reason, 3,000 readers around the globe, everybody was looking at different things. You know, someone from Sweden saw her ancestor in War and Peace, a great, great, great uncle his name mentioned and some fabric designers were was paying a lot of attention to the fabric described in Norn piece you know of course writers talk about you know the techniques crafts of writing so i think Norn piece is a book it's almost it's just like it's a, like a big garden I, I i this is a such a bad analogy except you know tolstoy likes to use bees as an analogy you know the bees going out to the honey to get the pollen i, I feel that war and peace it's it's really a metal and every reader is a little bee and we all go there and gather something well i think that's a wonderful metaphor and it's 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 certainly appropriate because mm -hmm. there is a a sense of the reading process as being organic. And I love the fact that a lot of this book is about the, the responses are about people discovering things about their own reading process, the habits that we all tend to have. And, and I love the fact that uh, people talk about the idea of slow reading, which I think is something that's very, very difficult to do. Could you talk maybe a little bit about what some of the, just for folks who aren't aware, 
-hmm. when when we talk about this this pay the the uh, the second side of the page, again, mm -hmm. these feature comments from folks who well, uh, folks who have chimed in, um, and there's about 120 of them, I think. Uh, yeah. That are in there. Very lots of very famous names, by the way, mm -hmm. and um, just talk a little bit about what what maybe some seasoned readers were surprised about in the in the process of discovery. Yes. Yeah, as you said, you know, the readers are really from all walks of life, you know, nurses, musicians, and writers, of course, and just, I, th I, I think, for instance, I, I like the poet uh, Philip, uh, Carl Phillips, who participated mm -hmm. both times, he's reading with us again. I mean, he's the first, I mean, I read Homer all the time, but I didn't make a connection between Tolstoy and Homer until he pointed out when Tolstoy described the whole army, you know, like a giant bird, and that came from Iliad. And it's just wonderful when the poet notices that something. And there was a, 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 there was a couple of people I think uh, veterans who Matt Gallagher, who was a uh, Iraqi vet, who was a novelist, and he, he he read with us and he brought his war experience, you know, modern war experience to to the to the reading. I remember very early on Dolokhov, who was this really the villain in in the book. Mm -hmm. He was insolent. He was cruel, but he was also a good soldier. And Matt said, you know, when I was in Iraqi, uh, in Iraq, there was this exactly the same Dolokhov character in my in my army, in my in my division. And he was so mean. But in the end, he saved a lot of people's lives because, you know, he just that's the that's the beautiful thing about human is, you know, nobody is perfect. Everybody's so flawed, but there's there's always a moment for someone to shine. Right. So so those are the things people notice and different readers. I, I think some people, for instance, some readers pay a lot of attention to the food they eat mm -hmm. or the economy. For instance, the Rostov family, I actually calculated how many dogs, how many hunting dogs they keep. And they need at least 150 pounds of meat every day just to keep the dogs, mm -hmm. not to mention. And it's a lot of money. You realize how why they went you know bankrupt in the end so so it is I, I i think war and peace happens to be a book about everything and so you can on different days you can look at different things i like the animals in the in the novel dogs horses birds right that's one of my favorite chapters by the or sections by the way where where the theme of the the, the pets are introduced and oh, yes. you begin to realize how sort of central uh, yes. to, the, to the landscape they are. You know, some of the issues of reading that kind of popped up, I noticed, and, and this again is just kind of, it's it's threaded throughout the book, but uh, I think something that we all struggle with in, in terms of reading is skimming mm -hmm. or uh, skipping portions. Um, you mentioned that um, in Tolstoy, you know, 19th century novels and in, in being encyclopedic, they're also famously repetitive, yes. and that that tends to be a theme or an issue that uh, the the modern readers really really get irritated by. So, could you talk a little bit about why some of these novels how can feel so repetitious for for uh, modern readers? And I think uh, in one of the podcasts you did, you you touched about a little bit upon serialization and yes. how that affects. Yes. Um, the, the sort of structure of the book. Yes. You know, War and Peace, like a lot of Dickens's novels, were serialized in, in magazines first. So, so he was thinking, he was still writing this, it, the novel when he was, you know, when he was giving the readers. For instance, I think some details, the Andre, Prince Andre's wife, the little princess, has short lips and, you know, mustache. He kept repeating that, or someone had a soft pair of white, soft hands, and he kept repeating. I feel those were, you know, from a writer's point of view, those were actually characteristic markers he made for himself while he was, you know, serializing. He was serializing these, these excerpts. 
And I, I do think you're right. I think the, the repetitiveness or sometimes, especially Tolstoy, he's really good at saying things three times, the same thing three times, <laughs> and, you know, across the landscape of word, the whole novel. I, I, I don't get bothered by that, partly because I read very slowly. So if I read this, you know, one day and next week I see the same description, I don't get upset. I just said, oh, yes, you already used that. You know, I just, you know, sort of just laugh. But I also, there's a other reason, there's another reason I am not upset about repetitiveness. It's actually, I think life is repetitive. And in the way we, the way I read War and Peace is the way I feel that I live my life is just, you know, one day at a time. You cannot dictate this day has to go this way because the days are not within our control. So in that sense, I think, I, I understand, I think contemporary readers want something more con, like consumable, right? If, yeah. you're, if you're a consumer, you want this bite to be perfect. You want that dish to be, to look good and taste good. And, but I think these older novels, I do feel like they are more life-sized than bite-sized. And, and so that explains their repetitions. That's great. Thank mm. you. I, 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 uh, another thing that I really enjoyed about the fact that was uh, that readers felt free to respond to sections that they found that they weren't into. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite comments comes from, um, let me make sure I've got it, Garth Greenwell here. Yes. And uh, he says, wow, these free Freemason chapters are terrible. So was Andre's schlocky resurrection just in time for Lise, whom suddenly he realizes he loved to die. If Susan Lucci isn't in the cast, I don't want this hetero melodrama. Relieved to know Tolstoy had his bad days, too. And I think I think sometimes, especially for those of us that are teachers, we feel the need to defend these novels right. and say every everything in it is a jewel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the great Gatsby that I've spent a lot of my career working mm -hmm. on is, is all of 140 pages. And, and even it has some rough patches, mm -hmm. including the opening, opening mm -hmm. section that <laughs> is kind of a challenge to get through. But um, I'm kind of wondering, you know, when when the issues of I, I think as teachers we really struggle with students a lot of times that, that their initial reaction is I can't get into it. I couldn't get into it. Mm -hmm. And that partly reflects, I think, our desire for novels to sort of give us a mirror back to ourselves mm -hmm. rather than maybe a mirror out to the world. So I'm kind of curious, did you did over the course of the novel, did people find themselves coming back to certain portions that they may have found dull. And once they were done, one of the great metaphors of the reading experience is, is uh, one of the contributors calls it a kaleidoscope. Yes. And I think it's kind of, a, you know, you, 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 you need the distance at a certain point to see it at all right. at once for it all to come together. Right. But I'm curious how much of the discussion was centered around likes and dislikes and, and did, did people, kind of grow out of those reactions? That's a, such a good question. I was imagining people would say, oh, I really hate this, or I cannot, I do not like this. I, th I think because we have such a big group of readers, I think readers who only read to like something or who react strongly by disliking, they probably already dropped off by page yeah. <laughs> 120. And I think that's such a good thing is, you know, I, I wrote in the introduction to, to the, to the book, you know, one piece is like a big tree. It's a, like a giant tree. You can look closer and see this leaf really, it, it's not perfect. You know, this branch is a little lopsided. Yeah. You can, you can, there are a lot to dislike, but there are a lot to like too. And I think, I think the, the, the discussion, the, the reader's discussion are oftentimes, you know, around, sometimes people do react, especially to the war part. You know, I, I remember when I was reading War and Peace, someone told me, he said, when I was in college, I only read the peace part. You didn't, you did not have to read it. <laughs> I got so insulted. I thought, Absolutely cannot do that. But I, I think, I think there are people who 
are not into the war part, but there are people who are really into the war part, and they are also there. These are readers quite articulate about why it is important to read too. So, so there are some, you know, the, it's funny because Gar's uh, complain about the Freemason part. That's the only part that I did not have any underlying word <laughs> annotation. <laughs> so clearly I was bored too by the Freemasons, but yeah. also for a good reason. Tolstoy was not good at inventing things. So all the characters in War and Peace, he had model, life model in his head. But he had no Freemason experience. He did. He wrote the Freemason chapters entirely based on research, and you could clearly see he didn't. He couldn't reinvent. Mm -hmm. no. you, you bring up two very different points in there that I want to follow up with. The first is the kind of the role of uh, annotation or marginalia when we read, and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about, I don't think there's a book that I own that, and it's it, from being a teacher, where I don't feel like I've read it unless I've underlined something, uh, and the notes in the margins. Could you talk a little bit about different people's experience with that as kind of keeping track of their reading? Right. And then the, then the, the kind of the follow-up on that, I guess, would be... Um, We'll start on that one because the the one just slipped my mind as I was prattling yes. on there. Yes. So I can show you my war and peace. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> there was a system, except by now the system is gone because I used to have used to have different colors for different things, and now now I'm reading a different copy because I just couldn't use that copy anymore. But I think you add, you you said something really good about the annotation. I always you know of course we tell students to always read with a pen i read it with i underline i annotate i think it is a way to have a conversation with the book rather than just passive accepting the reading you know I, to engage with with the text and so you know annotating of course is the my way of having a conversation with tolstoy but over the years because i've been reading this copy for years now and now it's actually also part of my conversation with myself at different stages of my life so there are moments you know in the past i would mark something say haha or smiley face or something and now i don't feel funny anymore i thought mm -hmm. you know it's not the book that has changed it's me change changing over time so, and I also noticed that at different readings, I tend to, I try to use different color of pen to annotate because I do notice different things with each yeah. reading. So it is a good way to sort of to leave the, I don't know, just to, to have a conversation with Tolstoy. I think one of the reasons that maybe uh, readers fear Tolstoy a little bit is there's a presumption that you need to know Russian history or, you know, kind of the, you know, the the entire sort of panorama of, mm -hmm. of, of time. So can you tell us a little bit about maybe what knowledge uh, different readers brought to the text? And for those audience members out there, uh, I'm also curious, I, I find when I read, I also, I think this is kind of a insecurity maybe that a lot of us have is I don't feel confident necessarily in my own interpretations unless I go and look up what Nabokov said about it or mm -hmm. what, you know, what an, another famous critic said about it. Um, so could you talk about those two things, about the, the sort of the, the, the breadth of knowledge mm -hmm. that readers maybe don't need to have? And then mm -hmm. what about the, crit the, the sort of secondary conversation right. about it? Right. Yeah, I think that's such a good question. You know, how much do we need to know the history of 1812 to read War and Peace? You know, how much do we need to know the Decemberists uh, revolt to know that Tolstoy actually meant to write about 1812? I mean, 1825, not 1812. So he went to the backstory, made the backstory into a novel. I think these are useful information, but not necessary. And absolutely, you know, we you can just go in. I think a lot of readers mentioned that the war and peace starts with a party you know 30 people at a party pierre went in not knowing anyone like us readers right we don't know who 
anyone is. We just hear them talk. We hear their, we watch their faces. We know something is going on, but we have no idea what is going on. But that's exactly how Pierre experiences. I think Tolstoy really is good. You know, I think that's the, it's not my word. It's actually speaking of secondary reader. I did an event with Alexandra Schwartz from the New Yorker. And she made a good point. She said, if Tolstoy wants an intimate novel, he would have started a novel with Natasha and Pierre or Natasha with another boy in the in a very intimate setting. But, but Tolstoy really meant the novel to be just broad. And so he <laughs> brought us to the party, confusing us, confusing the characters. But it, the confusion lasts only five seconds, you know, in the history of reading War and Peace, the moment you bypass that. So I think the readers don't have to know a lot of things. The good thing about these, you know, group reading is there's always someone who knows something, you know, someone who's a musician. There, there's a musician, Elon, uh, Elon Mazel, Mazel, and he brought in Tchaikovsky's music. He wrote a beautiful essay about Tchaikovsky's music. And there's some, so I'm so very sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> this is the danger of doing things in the house, right? So, so I, I think, the readers, you know, I, I don't consider myself a, like an like a expert on War and Peace or Tolstoy. I still consider myself a lay reader. I just get my lay readers joy Sorry, out of, yeah. And, and, and the, yes, and you said, you know, sometimes we look at other critics. You know, I, I do look at, you know, say Nabokov or, you know, Stefan Zweig or Isaac Babel, all these people talking about Tolstoy. Yeah. It's sort of good just to sort of to compare notes with all those dead people. Yeah. Well, and I'm I, I'm delighted that you mentioned the Tchaikovsky chapter because one of the things I really thought was fun about the book was the way occasionally we had a bit of a, a kind of experiment in form. So we will come across a little one or two page section that all of a sudden we're talking about the reading experience as if we're watching a play and we're talking about characters as actors and readers as, as actors as well. Uh, the use of the commentators, the music. It's also funny because there's a section where we insert uh, Tolstoy's reading list. Uh, you know, the books that he felt was essential. There's another section that I think is Adrian Rich and excerpt about yes. uh, 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 reading, reading Tolstoy. And then we have things like a catalog of smiles, which I thought uh, was very, very funny because we expect a novel, uh, even if it's only partially what we think of as realism, to somehow catalog human gesture and, and, you know, to be able to present us people as we see them. Can you talk a little bit about how the form came about, that Tchaikovsky uh, sort of mini essay that's in there? Was that written at the time or did that come around later? Or Yeah, that's such a good question and it's such a good observation. You know, we, we, when, we, when we started to make the book Tolstoy together, we, we had all the Twitter, you know, comments and but it's different when you put them together into a book. And really, actually, I have to credit Bridget Hughes, who is the editor of the book. She she has done most of the work, just compiling things and sort of picking up things. And those mini essays we commissioned after we compiled all the comments. It's just to give you know readers just a little bit more of something because really, you know, if you look at the the, the comments are all Twitter length, so tweet length. So, so there are those mini essays are just for, for just for curious minds to talk about something they're curious about. You you mentioned Bridget Hughes, and maybe we want to talk a little bit about who she is and what she does at uh, public space. But I was struck in listening to one of your interviews that she sort of confessed. I think it was the Lit Hub interview where she uh, sort of confessed that this was the first time she had actually read <laughs> War and Peace, I think. So um, uh, yes. tell us a little bit more about her role in it and about, uh, uh, you, we've used the word compiling, and I can only imagine what a, what a daunting challenge it was to sift through 3,000 
responses uh, for every, 85 days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, trying to yes. do, I'm trying to do that math in my head, 3,000 times 85. And right, right. So Bridget Hughes is the you know, editor and the founder and editor of Public Space. So, so she's a dear friend of mine, she's a very good editor and very good reader. It's funny you said she, she made a confession that was the first time she read War and Peace. For years, I've been, I was telling her to read War and Peace, and <laughs> she always said she brought the book out and she said, oh, it's too big too daunting, which is exactly what people's reaction is when you think about the war and peace. I think the title contributes to the daunting, you know, war and peace, such a serious title. So she read with in, with me, of course. And so when we did the book, I, I think her thought was, you know, it's it just cannot be a list of people's tweets. It has to have a structure. It has to have a sort of like a it has to have a nar narrative in the book mm -hmm. too and i think that's why she commits uh, commissioned people to write and also just the way she, i i noticed the way she puts the tweets together you know some on on certain days everybody is talking about the same thing but then um another day people are talking about 20 topics all yeah. different so it's it, it's a it's just the decision to make sense the continuously for instance the smile of course you know human gesture i like what you said you know <laughs> the human gesture that actually came from her again she look at all the smiles in used yeah. in in war and peace Another thing that I think people inevitably bring is their own experience with different genres. And I was very intrigued by the fact that a lot of commentators were connecting the novel to different other author, authors that we wouldn't necessarily put Tolstoy in the category with. I mean, Russian literature has such a unfortunate reputation as being yeah. doom and gloom. And, um, you know, uh, certainly Tolstoy's uh, reputation contributes to that. But I, I was very struck by the kind of people kept, a lot of people kept coming back to Jane Austen. Yes. And I'm wondering if you could kind of uh, talk a little bit about in what ways Tolstoy and Jane Austen might be read together and what we could get out of uh, setting them side by side. Yeah, I thought that's such an illuminating observation from people because before that, I made an observation that Turgenev, who's this really serious Russian writer, I always thought Turgenev's novels read like Jane Austen's novels. Hmm. And, and there was a reason, if you look at Jane Austen, Jane Austen's novel, in Jane Austen's novels, people talk all the time, characters talk all the time. You know, the novels are oftentimes really carried by dialogues and then, you know, in the, in the weather. I always think, you know, Austin's novels are dialogue and weather. And of course, you know, human drama. And I, I, I think you're right, the readers are right. Tolstoy, especially the peace part, it's all about marriage plot, for instance. <laughs> you know, who's going to marry whom? Who has the money to marry whom? And uh, who can marry whom? Which is exactly everybody's concern, as in Austin's novels. And also very domestic, you know, we, we don't think of, we don't think of Tolstoy as a domestic writer, but he paid a lot of attention to, to the, to the physical details of life in the inside a house. I, I, I imagine in the old time in 19th century, 18th century life probably was carried on more inside the house than outdoors. Right. So, so I think ju just as Austin, they're really writing about the house lived in the drawing room and, you know, at the party, at the dance. So it's, I, I absolutely, I, I, after told one piece last year, I reread all Austin and I thought, well, this is just fun. You know, they would enjoy each other. Yeah. And I, you know, one of the things that we have been trying to focus on in our program is literary tourism. And we should oh, yeah. mention oh, yeah. that the, the Tolstoy house, um, it, you know, it, it, it is, I, I think it's still open to the public or mm -hmm. I, I can't remember if the, for the pandemic, but um, I, I'm kind of curious just in terms of 
you know, I think one of the ways that academically we sometimes uh, limit ourselves is we teach ourselves to read for, for theme. And we're always looking to sort of synthesize meaning rather than, um, you know, to record our visceral responses to things. And I'm just curious, out of the 500 characters, was there one particular character that uh, that readers seem to rally around? The most obvious contrast, I guess, would be Andre and Pierre, yeah. but yeah. I'm just kind of curious. That was one thing that I learned from group reading. You know, I've been reading this novel forever. I I was I never liked Andre before last year because I just loved Pierre. He almost like you just pick and choose. I just pick Pierre. I felt very close to Pierre, but I very soon I realized people really articulate their like of Andre and their support, and so it's there's this ongoing joke that there's a team Andre and team Pierre at Tolstoy together. But people, you know, more often I think people are on both teams. They, they love, they like both characters, you know, for their flaws more than for their, yeah. like, you know, the strengths. So I, I, yeah, I think 550 characters, there are a lot of characters. I think there's one character that, a minor character that has caused some disagreement is Sonia Rostov, mm -hmm. you know, the orphan who lived with Rostov. And I think some people really thought Tolstoy treated her unfairly, gave her a really hard life, lost her, you know, everything, did not have her love. And some people really just very articulate said they could not stand her. There was not a moment of realness in her. So I think those, I, I love, I think what you're right. I think like in a classroom setting, we talk about important things. We really don't talk about these characters as though they're just our next door neighbors. Right. Of course we like our neighbor or we hate our neighbor for a reason. So I like I like the, the Tolstoy Together community reading the books really as though these characters are people in our lives. I, I, and I apologize. I was fumbling around in my book because I wanted to show the oh yes the, uh, the for and against <laughs> section, which I thought was very uh, very funny, where people uh, took sides about uh, uh, Andre and whether we stood for him or uh, against him. I'm kind of curious too. Um, one of the I think one of our struggles when we read is always the intrusion of our own lives going on. And I'm wondering to what degree different readers found themselves relating events in the novel to the personal experience. There's one wonderful example on uh, where Andy Black comes in and announces the birth of his child. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering, um, you know, are there other big significant events. I, did, I didn't see anybody reading Tolstoy, fortunately, with the, uh, while they were walking down the wedding aisle, but... <laughs> there was no wedding last year. <laughs> that, uh, well, that's true. That's a great point. Yeah. You're right. I think that's the other fascinating part of this book. It's really... Part of, part of it, it's about war and peace, but a part of it is about readers' lives and how people live in real time. Andy Black you know, had a baby on the, mo on a day, the reading was so harsh and bloody and bleak and, and yet there was a new life and, and someone adopted a dog during a pandemic and named the dog after the dog of the hunting scene in when Rostov and uncle, they hunted and there's a dog named Rugai. And so he wow. named his dog Rugai. And I like to see those little moments of real life intersecting with 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 uh, the novel. This year, we have several new mothers reading with us. Wonderful. Yes, and they take pictures of their because when you are a new mother, you cannot sleep. You might as well just stay up and read War and Peace. We we I want to come back to that, and we should mention that you started a second round of 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 this project in September. For you, it's a rereading, but it's it's uh, the second time through this project. But we do want to invite audience questions, and we do have one uh, right away. So the first question is, um, 
Yoon. I assume you read other books concurrently with War and Peace and Moby Dick. Uh, do you slow read those other big books as well? Yes, that's such a good question. I slow read every single thing, even if a novel is a hundred page long. I would read ten page a day, just ten pages a day. So I have found that helpful because I I think I mean part of the reason I am a writer. So when I write, I don't imagine how many readers read my book. I do imagine a particular reader how long it takes. A reader to read my book. You, you sort of want the readers to spend some time with your creation, and I think all books deserve my attention. So, so I read about ten to twelve books a day, but I only spend half an hour with each book. So That's it's awesome. slow reading across board, and I have to say, I, I think that's one thing that makes life consistent for me. Yes. There, there's a fabulous question that popped up that I actually had on my list to ask as well. Um, and again, this is kind of a classroom issue, I think, for many of us that where uh, teachers have definite um, in, in prejudices towards certain translations or not. And I don't think you required a particular translation. The book, the page numbers in, in, in the book are geared toward a certain one. Could you talk about some of the controversies in translation and yeah. whether readers were able to keep up with different translations uh, throughout the project? Yes, that's such a good question because, you know, anytime you read Russian literature or read any literature, the translation, translator's decision is a part of the, you know, the, the reading experience. I read, I've read Pavir Volonsky, Volonsky's uh, translation for a long time, but at this time I'm reading Anthony Briggs. But there are other I there it's that's a, another part of the beautiful part of the the, the 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 project is people read different translations and compare translations. For instance, I think different translators have different this make different decisions. PV they stayed very loyal to the to the to the text, to the Russian text. So sometimes it doesn't make sense actually when you read it. Then then you if you look at other translations, other translators make different uh, decisions. The thing is, translations are always going to be limited by not being the original. And there is a translator, uh, Tom Kitson, who did an event with us. He, I really thought he said something so wonderful. He said, "Well." You know, you can go to every translation and find faults with this translation. But the, 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 the good thing to remember is they're good enough. Every translation is good enough. Like every, you know, if you're a good parent, you're a good enough parent. You're not a perfect parent. So so I think the good thing about Tolstoy, you know, about War and Peace, it's such a good book. No matter what translations you read, you still get a lot of, out of it. And, and I do a little bit of comparative reading. And just to see the translators, how they use different words. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the most fascinating sort of areas of literary study is the history, histories of translations where you right. get into sort of the political backgrounds of what people could say or not say at certain at certain periods of time. That does bring me though up to, I think, an experience that maybe right. some of us that grew up in the 70s or 80s had where they had these uh, what I think were politely called condensed or abridged versions of big novels. Um, and I can remember growing up where parents had uh, sort of an encyclopedia set. Seems sort of silly now in the age of the Gutenberg website, but Project Gutenberg. But um, people would buy these and they would cut out, you know, basically all of the parts that um, that that you know didn't contribute to the plot i guess you would say but i'm wondering did anybody <laughs> did any of your readers try to sneak into a condensed version and second of all can you talk can you talk about how you maybe feel about condensed or abridged versions of big novels right no i i'm not aware any reader has read a condensed version so that did not happen and but i know exactly the thing you mentioned because when I was a child, I read the abridged edition of Dante in Chinese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure it's already translated and then abridged. Well, it, I, 
Well, I, I have a lot of problem with that, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's not the writer's decision. It's, it's someone else's decision to digest literature for other people. I would really hate to read literature, you know, in that secondhand way. And, and also, I do think you're right. I think people do that just so that anything extra, you know, extra, anything unrelated to plot are they're cut out, but they are the interesting part of literature as they are interesting part of life. I think the irrelevant part of literature or like, for instance, War and Peace, there are all these discussions about history, politics, you know, philosophy, but they're also just very irrelevant part about women's clothes and mm -hmm. how to make pickles and food. And those are life to me. And those you can, you know, it's, you have to read original novel. I will say my favorite sentence in the book is yours. And I want to read it and ask you um, to perhaps explain it a little bit because it's something that I've come back to over and over again. But this is on page 132, day 56 mm -hmm. of our reading. So this is May 12, 2020. And the quote is uh, from Tolstoy, in a battle, it is a matter of what is dearest to a man, his own life. And it sometimes seems that salvation lies in running back, sometimes in running forward. And your commentary on this is that literature and life would be so boring if that word seems did not exist. Now, at the risk of reducing what I think is a, a just a beautiful sentence and very uh a fun sentence to get sort of caught in. Um, could you maybe explain what you meant by that a little bit? <laughs> That's such a good question. I think I may have, I may have had Hamlet on my mind when I wrote that. You know, Hamlet. You know, <laughs> said seem. I don't. I don't. I know no seem. I. I. I am yeah, instead of seem. I'm. I'm paraphrasing Hamlet, of course. But, but I do think I like. <laughs> I like there actually Tolstoy likes to use seem a lot, which means there are different layers of truths, but you, there's a surface truth. So he would give you that surface truth and then he would let you go search for the deeper truths. For instance, there was a very minor sentence at one of the dancing parties for the younger girls. These were not debutantes. These were the pre-debutant girls, teenage girls. And he had this description of the girls who were pretty or who seemed to be pretty. <laughs> I just thought, you know, that when you describe someone who seemed pretty or who, who were pretty, you can go on and just imagine everything yeah. about that girl and her family and her teacher, dancing teacher. Everything is in that scene. That, that particular passage made me and I, it made me wish I had been proud of the project because it, it sent me to Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities where he talked about the sort of the socialites in New York and famously sort of disparaged them as the social x-rays because they were so so uh, sort of thin and anorexic in the 80s. But um, we are running a little short on time so I did want to ask uh, just two more quick questions. The first is you had mentioned that a lot of these novels, especially in the 19th century, uh, step outside of fiction to, to take on more essayistic sorts of things. And um, toward the end of War and Peace, it, it is in it, at the ending there, um, there's a great deal on Tolstoy's thinking, his effort to create a sort of grand theory of, of history. And some of the responses I thought uh, were very amusing. One of the readers said, this is kind of like mansplaining, which I think I laughed out loud when I read that. But for those of us who might hit some of those stretches of what we might call novels of ideas, maybe, how do we handle that? What would you suggest is a, is a way to, to, to deal with those and to try to arouse in ourselves the same excitement that we might have when we're, when we're reading about characters or plot twists? Right. You know, Tolstoy, of course, is, you know, infamous for, for doing that, those long epilogues and essays. And I know some readers get frustrated. I don't only because I like to see all these statements he made, but I like to imagine ways to make those statements into stories. Or, you know, I like to imagine in my life, can I find a person 
who can match, who I can match a person to this statement or to that statement. So in a way, just to entertain myself, which is to say some of the essayistic part are quite long and boring. So I just amuse myself by making the reading more fun. Great. Well, we are uh, out of time, but I, I did want to ask, how did the pandemic, do you think, affected people's reading? And like I said, what would you say are the differences between the event in the spring of 2020 and the event so far that you started uh, back in September? I think, well, the, during the pandemic, I think people are much I, I, let me put this way. I think last year was not only pandemic, it was also politically fraught year. You know, the election hasn't happened when we were reading that. And right. there was a lot of commentary in one piece about history and politics. So I think last year, pe readers were quite keen making connections between war and peace and the, the history we lived through or the life we lived through. This year, I think you can clearly feel that even though the pandemic is still there, not over, I think people feel less pressured in a way. So I think this time, this round of reading, people are much more curious about smaller things, which is just wonderful, I think. That's a wonderful response. I, 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 would, I know a lot of uh, other reading groups were kind of taking on novels that had some sort of metaphorical relation to the pandemic, uh, Camus' The Plague being the most obvious one. Yeah. But um, I, I just love this book, and I really think that the, 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 the idea of a community read is very important in these days and times and the use of the social platforms to sort of bring people together. And the fact that we bring it back into a form of a book, which is available to our audience. And I recommend um, that, that everyone pick this up. It's really such a wonderful project. And I do appreciate you uh, uh, allowing me to be your uh, interlocutor you here. Thank um, you for asking the good questions. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, fun and very easy to do. So uh, if you would just wrap up by telling us where we can learn more about the project or where maybe we can follow it on Twitter yeah. or uh, where we can learn more about maybe some future projects. Yes, I think two best ways. One is to just to go to a public space dot org, you know, sign up the newsletter and they have Every week they have update about Tolstoy together, or go on to social media. The hashtag is Tolstoy together, and I was very proud that I came up with that hashtag Tolstoy together. I thought it was quite nice. So, so the people's discussions are under that hashtag. That's great. That's one thing I didn't ask about was the title, but I love the alliteration of it, mm -hmm. and again the the emphasis on uh, on community. So. <laughs> We want to thank folks out there. Yun Lee, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. And to, to everyone out there, uh, thank you for support of this uh, festival. And we look forward to the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.